Hello and welcome to another episode of the Doctor Who Fan Podcast, I am once again your host Jeffrey Gibson, and in this episode I am going to be reviewing, the story The Chase, so let's begin as we have a lot to discuss. The basic idea for this story sells well, get ready for a rip-roaring roller coaster ride through time, with your favorite 1960s TV monster on the tail of the lovable good old Doctor and his friends the whole time. But wait. Once again, we get a large dose of experimental, off-the-point directing from Richard Martin. If you can go along with that, it's possible to enjoy this faced-paced romp through time. The intended sarcasm doesn't quite work as Vicky promptly declares herself useless, and her initial scenes of irritating her fellow travelers are decidedly useless, lacking any sense of warmth or charm or entertainment value. The doctor proceeds to make a truly terrible noise with his latest toy as well. The Dalek voices are lame once more, not as bad as in the Dalek Invasion of Earth story number 10, but close. Under this director, the Daleks also like to run around in circles and agitate back and forth a lot, which is out of character and distracting. Ray Cusick may have come up with a great design for a trick Dalek time capsule but the director goes out of his way to make sure the camera moves right in to show the audience how to see through it to the studio wall on the other side, destroying the illusion. Following that, he can't even get it to dematerialize with a standard effect. Another needless zoom in on the visualizer's blank screen confuses the Grams operator, causing him to think he's jumped ahead of his cue with the TARDIS dematerialization noise only to have to restart it again moments later. Utter chaos reigns once more in Richard Martin Studios' session, and again particularly in the first episode. Sound is the chief culprit this time around, but having William Hartnell operate an invisible control console was no stroke of brilliance either, as if no one would notice. Even the title sequence gets botched with a needless stop and restart. One wonders how many of these gaffes the restoration team will try to fix for the DVD release. Dudley Simpson's music has returned closer to the cutesy style he used in Planet of Giants, although it's a bit more jazzed up and adult here. Too bad we're denied something similar to his superior work on the Crusade, but at least there are a few interesting themes. The writing isn't much on character or dialogue, but it is fast-paced whisking the audience away from each time and place before any of it becomes too boring. Episode 1 begins with some historical snippets, including an alright clip of the ancient Beatles performing Ticket to Ride. Vicky's historical point of view of them gets more appropriate with each passing year. Sadly, it seems not everyone gets to see this part of the episode, apparently, PBS reruns include this bit. Store bought VHS video all over the world did not. Word is, DVD versions have it back in. If you can get the European Region 2 copy, and if you have an appropriate player and TV monitor for it, North Americans may still be expected to shell out for a copy that leaves it out. And who knows how butchered the audio commentary will be that talked over this clip as well. Episode 2's title The Death of Time seems to have nothing whatsoever to do with anything in the episode. Terry Nation was particularly nasty towards the Aridians he created, they've got lots of problems of the type that the Doctor would typically resolve in heroic fashion, and even more damning in this case, the problems arise because of his presence, but the Aridians only get his sympathy this time around. He's too busy trying to get himself and his companions out of a predicament, and is happy to take advantage of their problems when it offers him a chance to escape. The Aridians end up much worse off after the Doctor's brief visit. In our director's defense, we have to give Richard Martin credit for giving us the first example of the TARDIS dematerialization sound being reversed during a landing in episodes 3 and 4. Nice one. All that remains is to lop off the final wheeze and add a thud and you'd have the sound we all became accustomed to hearing throughout the 1970s and 1980s. The acting still remains cheesy throughout though. 
the tour guide's New York accent isn't bad, but somehow it's still obviously faked. The dialogue isn't very natural either, too much emphasis on sounding like a New Yorker, and not enough on saying something intelligent. Then we come to Peter Purvis' debut as Morton Dill. I admire the way he can usually throw himself completely into a role with a lot of energy and make it watchable, but poor old Morton is scripted to go way over the top, so that's what you get. This is one of only three scenes to show the Dalek timed machine coming and going properly, so enjoy it while it lasts. There are some better performances in the Marie Celeste sequence, or Mary? Not to mention a very atmospheric sequence of the abandoned ship, but the scripted interaction between guest characters and regulars is pretty dull at this point. The same can be said of the haunted house sequences, as far as horror and suspense goes, the house and its characters are far too much of a badly acted joke. I think it was a mistake to hide the true nature of both of these locations until after all our travelers leave the scene. The Marie Celeste sequence holds no true interest for our main characters or the audience until after we realize what ship we were on, which is too late. Sir Ian Chesterton and the Doctor come up with some fascinating theories for the haunted dimension of fear location, which would support the apparition's ability to withstand Dalek fire. The funhouse revelation cheapens the whole sequence, not to mention the Dalek's abilities and sense of menace. What we get for action here is pretty cheesy anyway, more mindless mayhem and running about. Some itchy cameraman had to readjust the frame of the TARDIS in lay shot, giving away the effect once again. At least we get plenty of drama out of Vicky's makeshift travel arrangements and the Dalek's increasingly devious plans. I see an expensive cut was used to go from the Doctor's double to a close-up of William Hartnell. Why not make the cut a little earlier, and let William Hartnell do the whole final scene? Then you'd never know a double was used. Although the landings on Mechanus are substandard, we've been seeing a lot of them lately anyway, so that's okay. Simply by exercising his sole right to pilot the TARDIS, the Doctor has generally had more important things to do than any of his companions so far in this adventure. At long last, Episodes 5 and 6 give us some excellent examples of Hartnell heroism, which Season 2 has sorely been lacking. Although it's fairly obvious which of the two Edwardian gentlemen is William Hartnell and which is the actor's double, it isn't so obvious to tell the Doctor from the Dalek robot, as the two actors swap roles frequently. And I think we have to give thanks to both Terry Nation for asking for this sequence and Richard Martin for delivering it, because this is so much better than the TV version of the massacre, which tried in part to base itself much more heavily on the idea of William Hartnell's double, and failed to come up with as entertaining or effective a sequence as what we get here. The companions do their best to sort things out and help but only the doctor can be sure who's who, and he alone deals with the robot in the end. There's also a nice moment when the doctor decides to face the Daleks alone to spare his companions, a futile gesture, but bravely heroic, I'm very glad that avenue was explored before it was discarded. William Hartnell's The Man in Episode 5. Thank you, Terry Nation, for finally figuring it all out. Episode 5 also has the best cliffhanger. The mechanoids make a sudden and enigmatic entrance, while the audible Dalek threat encourages the four travelers to take their chances with the new creature. Episode 6 proceeds to be the most interesting of all during the chase. Although the model work shows up a bit with the tiny tug and pull mechanoid, the sequence remains interesting with scenes that double for exploration of the city and for first contact. A soon-to-be companion is introduced, bringing the main cast up to five, as Peter Purvis switches to the role he will be most remembered for on Doctor Who. The scenes of Stephen Taylor meeting the rest of the crew demonstrate that Purvis is a much more sensible actor than he might have at first appeared, and Stephen is quite a charming, friendly fellow. On a PBS TV broadcast, Lionheart's episode 6 credits attempt to serve the entire story and unfortunately Peter Purvis is credited for Morton Dill again, with no mention of his more important role as Stephen Taylor. Who does these credits? 
don't they pay attention to the series? The script has a big hole in its logic here. Stephen says that the Earth's population forgot all about the half-built colony on Mechanus, yet he knows all about its history, and finds it incredible that the time travelers don't. This could easily be sorted out or explained one way or the other, but the script didn't do the job. The worst part of episode 6 are the Dalek portrayals in the video studio. The so-called conquerors of the universe are far too lamely put out of action in this one. A Dalek barely gets touched by the flimsiest of a mechanoid's limbs, and he cries out totally immobilized. Without even making an attempt to free himself. The Doctor finally uses the device he's been building for the last two episodes, and actually gets to knock out one of the Daleks, so good for him, and very heroic. Too bad the Dalek decides to ham it up and wail uncharismatically, while the tiniest puff of smoke pours out of the Doctor's machine, and after a badly timed cue, out of the Dalek. This is too lame for forgiveness. Things begin interestingly enough when the five travelers prepare to scale down from the city on a rope, and Vicky has a real challenge to overcome her fear. Sir Ian makes a real idiot out of himself at this point though. His grip on Barbara seems to be designed to let her fall over the edge minus her pants. If that isn't bad enough, he lets go of her completely, and ignores all the reassurances he had just given to Vicky, to go chase after a panicking Stephen. Sure Stephen should have stayed to help, but it's not your place to fix his attitude and neglect your own responsibilities, Sirian. What a pair of unwatchable dorks. What happened to Sirian's solid guts? Where is the director when you need him? The doctor's the only man left towing the line, so let's hope his reserve alien strength comes into play. The filmed battle between the Daleks and the Mechanoids is a vast improvement on their video interaction. It's not very good at showing exactly what is happening to which character, but in this particular case, high energy mayhem is the only thing that needs to come across to keep the story moving, and there is plenty of that. Both Daleks and Mechanoids turn out good, menacing, in character performances here, so right on. Post climax, we get an important bit of drama, as Barbara and Surian make their exits. The writing, acting and everything are generally really well done from here on. I was always particularly impressed by the creativity in the sequence of still photos of Barbara and Surian back in 1960s London. I later learned that Douglas Camfield took those shots. Somehow, I'm not surprised. I'm not sure why we get a shot of Stephen making it safely to the ground, but no scene of him joining the Doctor and Vicky in the TARDIS. It makes the Doctor appear needlessly callous in abandoning a fellow survivor, when indeed this was not the case. So what are my conclusions? All in all, Episode 6 is an action-packed landmark half-hour, and the Doctor fares well in both the heroic and character departments. All things considered and balanced, an above-average episode not to be missed. The Chase is definitely the best of Richard Martin's Season 2 stories, and remains particularly gripping from the middle of Episode 4 to the end. Thus, director Richard Martin leaves the Doctor Who directing universe on a bit of a high note, and has become one of the most entertaining and lively participants on DVD interviews and commentaries. Nice. It's easy to see how his infectious enthusiasm became a driving force for his productions, and caused him to be asked back over other, more reluctant directors. Have I been too hard on him? considering the enormous technical restraints of television in those days? Perhaps, but other directors of the time faced the same constraints, and I think my preferences for their results will stand. So now it's time to mark this story, and as always I am going to be judging it on the acting, writing, directing and execution, and for the acting it's a 6 out of 10, the writing gets a 7 out of 10 the directing gets a 5 out of 10 and the overall execution gets a 10 out of 10, and those scores give this story a 28 out of 40. Well folks it's time to bring this episode to an end. I will be back on Wednesday to review another Doctor Who story, as next Sunday will be our Legends of the Sea Devils preview.
so until Wednesday, thank you all so much for listening, stay safe, and go away.